Um, I would like to welcome back and introduce our second group of speakers. And um, this part of the program, we're going to act a little bit like the show, The Talk. So I'm going to ask our esteemed visitors questions and let them weigh in. But you might make notes because at the end of this, we're going to allow you to weigh in too, should you be so inclined. So please make note of your questions. And if you just cannot control yourself when we're talking about something, if you'll raise your hand, I might recognize you. <laughs> so let me once again introduce Judge Rebecca Connolly. Um, 88 Law. She is United States Bankruptcy Judge for the Western District of Virginia. And we regularly send her clerks, both externs and permanent. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, she is a former trustee, um, as she would say, Standing Chapter 13 trustee and Chapter 12 trustee for the Western District of Virginia. And she's been a frequent speaker for Virginia Continuing Legal Education Programs and a frequent guest to the law school, so thank you. And thank you for all that you've done in helping launch this program. Um, we had two speakers this afternoon, one of them, Marie Washington, who was a graduate of 2003 and um, she had a family medical emergency and could not be with us, so I'm disappointed that we won't hear from her this afternoon. I'm sure she's here with us in spirit. We also had um, another speaker, Elizabeth Gunn, whose name you may have seen on the program. And regrettably, she was in a car accident yesterday. The good news is that neither she nor her family are hurt, but they were all quite shaken up. So we won't just have the benefit of her experiences as well. But we also have um, Judge Jacqueline Moore. I know her as Jackie. Do we still call you Jackie? Absolutely. Okay. Um, who graduated from Washington only in 1983 and is a judge for the General District Court for the 23rd Judicial District of Virginia. She's been Chief Judge since 2006. I might add that for many years um, I supervised the student judicial, com uh, the student judicial clerks program before we have created the third year program. And for so many years, so very many years, we had one female on any bench in southwestern Virginia. So it's very exciting that we have two with us this afternoon. <laughs> so um, prior to that, um, Jackie worked as a public defender and was the deputy chief public defender. She's an adjunct professor at uh, Virginia Western Community College and Radford University, although I don't know what you're teaching there. Introduction to courts and points of law. So, um, she's been in involved in a number of professional organizations, including the Virginia State Bar Association, the <coughs> Virginia Women's Attorney Association, and the American Judges Association. So, welcome. And we have um, Kelly Pagliani, who is a regular visitor to the law school. And um, the notes of when you graduated, and I did 1992. 1992. <laughs> okay. Um, she was editor in chief of the Law Review, and um, has gone on to practice court to year with Justice Compton, who was on the Virginia Supreme Court. And then entered litigation practice where she's been. And she regularly returns with some of her colleagues to teach a third year practicum in mergers and acquisitions. So thank you for all of that effort as well. Um, she is currently a litigation partner and serves as deputy general counsel for the firm. It involves representing the firm on ethics and risk management issues, challenges in and of its own self. Um, so, oh, let me also say that she has been married for 25 years and has a 15-year-old high school freshman and a nine-year-old third grader. All of family, manage family, manage big wall, <laughs> share those secrets with us. <laughs> and um, Laura Frazier, 
here who have just shown you how I can't do paper management today. So, um, Laura is a, uh, well, after graduation in 2008, he became a public defender in, in Martinsville and served for two years in that capacity and then joined a small firm until January 2014 when she started her own practice. More power to you. <laughs> Maybe we'll learn some more about how one hangs out with Shingle. Goes it alone. So, um, she's married to a graduate of, uh, uh, who uh, uh, also works as a public defender. She has a two-year-old son, Parker, and a seven-month-old. So, starting a new practice with young children um, is mind-boggling to me. So, okay. You now know those from whom you're going to hear words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to start with some questions, um, direct the question at one of the panelists, and then uh, the rest of you should weigh in as you feel so inclined. And when we've talked through that, I think we will uh, move on to another question. So um, let me begin by uh, talking about one of the most important things that we might be discussing, and that is um, the theme about mentorship. And we heard how um, Coach Johnson um, found mentors. Um, I'd be interested uh, if you would begin the conversation about not only how did you find people to mentor you, but what you do in addition to them. I mean, our clerks are working with him <laughs> to mentor, but are there any special things that you would suggest uh, about finding a mentor? And also beginning to be in the role because some of you are third years and you can certainly begin mentoring first year students or even mentoring those students who have been admitted and who are a little bit nervous about thinking about beginning their law school careers. So I think I'll start with you. Jessica. All right, thank you, Sally. And, and if any of you can't hear, I don't know what our microphone situation is, um, raise your hand. Uh, you have, uh, there are microphones on the table. Right. Right. But just in case we don't talk into the microphone, you can't hear us. Please raise your hand um, and jump up and down, and we can start shouting. Um, I, I my experience was similar um, to Judge Johnstone's in that I um, I had to sort of initiate to seek out a mentor, but I also would find just as many of the women who just spoke talked about, I never had any problem finding anyone, uh, male primarily. I'd say that most of the experienced lawyers that. Um, I had a chance to uh, work with were male, but none of them uh, were unwilling to, to talk with me. In fact, most lawyers like to talk about themselves, <laughs> so it really is hard to, especially when you are um, seeking advice and uh, asking them for assistance that allows them to sort of shine, you know, they all have the peacock in them. And so I found that um, it, 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 can, it can work out fine um, when you are uh, seeking uh, out uh, assistance as long as you are um, open to hearing whatever that person has to say. They may not be able to tell you exactly how to make the right you know, work-life balance or, or you know, what, to, what to wear, but they may have some tip that's going to make a difference about how, how to make a difference in Judge Levy's court. I, you know, I know something about Judge Levy, and by the way, you should do such and such in her court. Or they might be able to tell you some other sort of secret. When you file something, be sure you call the person in the first office and ask for this name. You know, they'll tell you some little inside tip, and I can take it all in. Um, I also would uh, suggest a couple of things. I would. Um, I would remember that uh, when you're seeking out a mentor, um, you are, again, wanting to find out what that person can share with you. You're not asking them to really do something for you other than share with you from their experiences. And I have found that there's been some folks who have uh, claimed that they haven't had the best experience with the mentor because, well, after all, after the you know, court hearing, they didn't sit down and explain to me all the things that happened at the hearing and what was good and what was bad. They went off and you know, answered emails or, or returned phone calls. So, gee, that's not a very good mentor. And that's a person who is thinking um, that, that, that they're looking for another person to, to go out of their way to, you know, to do something just for that one person. On the other hand, 
if the, um, the student or the, the uh, young lawyer had simply inquired um, of him in when, when the moment is, is uh, available, what would you think was good and what do you think was bad, more than likely they're going to get some answers. Um, and we're letting it turn, but some others have some suggestions. I will just mention a few things for, um, for you. Uh, if you are going to mentor others or if you are uh, looking for mentors as women. Um, uh, be sensitive to the comments um, that uh, Monica mentioned. And something that um, I think is, is a little bit more common today than it may have been for, for, for Sally and the first class of women at WNL, and that is a sense of competition and almost cattiness. And I would say that we need to be supportive of each other. And please avoid the mean girls and mama. It really does exist. It exists in professional fields, and you want to avoid that as much as possible. We think it doesn't exist. Oh, no, we would never do that. But yet, you may find that that can sort of happen, and you want to be absolutely certain that you're not doing anything to condone that. For example, just because someone has made a choice that you think might not be the wisest choice um, or a popular choice, the last thing you want to do is criticize them for the right thing, for criticize them or ostracize them for their choices. And sometimes women may choose something that might be uh, less um, uh, uh, traditional. And that we can get into the other uh, uh, issues later on. But, but please be encouraging of others, including the choices that they make. Uh, I'd like to follow up with that by saying that um, when I began practicing law in 1983, uh, we were still in the uh, dress of uh, we wore little suits and not quite the cap, the, 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 bows. the bows, but we couldn't wear pants. And I wore pants to uh, the office the first day, and my boss about fell out of the chair. He didn't know quite how to tell me this was inappropriate dress. Um, and so finally, after much rallying around with the secretary and some other people in the firm, he came to me very timidly and said, I really would appreciate it if you wouldn't do that because I think our senior judge might not let you in the courtroom. And that was his way of trying to deal with the situation and trying to be a mentor to me instead of saying, go home. You don't know how to dress, what the proper appearance is. So sometimes you have to help a mentor mentor you. <laughs> I want to add to that story a little bit, and this was, um, this was not here, but in my, my very first professional job as, I can describe it only as baby librarian, uh, and I had an assistant who then was referred to as a secretary, and who had very little money. Her mother-in-law had made her a wool pantsuit. It was a handsome pantsuit. She wore it to work and was by my boss fired on the spot, told her to clean out her desk. I was so furious, and I felt so helpless to figure out how wrong that was because she looked very professional. And, and to this day, we still see instances where the Washington Post will comment on a situation um, just within the last couple of years. Now, I, it was probably a bad idea, I think, but a woman who was arguing before the Supreme Court took off her coat and put it on the back of the chair, and the Washington Post chose to comment on. So while we would prefer that it's not as important, that still does carry some badge. It, it does. It truly does. And, and you must present yourself in a professional manner, not only in the manner in which you conduct business, but also in the manner in which you look. Um, so, that afternoon, I realized that in order for me, the only woman in that public defender's office, to be able to practice successfully was to put him at ease so I could learn from him because he had been practicing for a very long time and he knew the ins and outs of criminal law. And I did not. Well, I had a lot of book sense, but I had no clue practically how to do this. And so by putting him at ease, I was able to learn from him. He was then not threatened or challenged by me, and I was able to learn a lot from him. I would also echo what uh, Judge Conley said, and that is that you have to initiate lots of times relationships with people uh, in order to receive that benefit. And don't think that, um, that you should put yourself out there with the expectation that someone is, is going to reciprocate fully 
uh, to your expectations. Uh, maybe that person can't reciprocate fully, but can offer you limited advice and information that you can use uh, and use to the betterment of yourself as a practicing attorney and as a professional in the courtroom. Um, and as far as what things I do to mentor, I'm uh, the clinical practice here at WNL practices regularly in front of me. I so enjoy having the students come and practice law. Um, when I appoint the public defender, when I, excuse me, when I appoint the, um, uh, Mr. Shapiro uh, or uh, uh, J.D. King to uh, represent um, an individual, I always tell the individual, you know what, you're getting three lawyers, one lawyer, the two assistants that will work um, untold hours on your petty larceny case. They will, un they will leave no stone un unturned. You're a really lucky person to have the WL law firm represent you. And people walk out, yeah, that's right. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then when they get to court, then when they get to court, they are flanked by uh, either Mr. Shapiro or Mr. King and one student lawyer who has invested more time in that small case than any other practicing lawyer in the area. And they do a great job. So that's one way that I think I'm mentoring others and they come back and talk to me about their experiences. And, and that's a really uh, terrific uh, way for me to watch and develop uh, young lawyers grow. And it's, uh, it's very rewarding. Uh, but uh, take advantage of that mentor opportunity. Initiate it yourself. Don't wait for somebody to come and say to you, hey, I'd like to be your mentor. Because that's not going to happen. A practical spin to that, <clears throat> to this generation out there of the, the, the newbie lawyers. Get the heck out of electronic communications and do it in person. Mm -hmm. Go to lunch, yeah. walk down the hall, stop in somebody's office. You don't need to take up 15, 20, 30 minutes. You can take three minutes. Go by and say, good morning. What's on your desk today? Or let them know what's on your desk today. At the end of the day, leave and say good night. These are silly, practical things that I am telling you the young lawyers forget to do and they miss eons of wisdom because they sit there at their desk and they send emails and they don't get up and they don't interact with people, human beings, you've got to. And so if you haven't heard them say, don't get a mentor, singular, get mentors, plural, and go to them on their terms, right? Don't sit there thinking they're going to come to you on your terms. You've got to, I, I'm, I'm different than, than she's going to be, and then she's going to be, and she's going to be. And where are you going to catch me? You figure that out. Figure it out. I'm the good morning, good night person. I'm the I'll sit down at lunch with you person. That's who I am. I'm not going to go out for drinks. i got kids. I've got a thousand activities. That's not who I am. But I'll spew as much as I can in the five minutes that you can get me. I am happy to share whatever I've got that can help you. I'm happy to find out what's going on in your life. And when you tell me what's going on in your life, I can help connect dots when the right opportunity comes along to be the right opportunity for you. So you have to connect personally, in person, outside of electronic communications. Let them see who you are. Let them know what you're good at so they can help you connect those dots and make that mentors with an S. Uh, as the resident baby lawyer on the panel, I uh, haven't had a lot of experience with mentoring others, um, but uh, I'm very fortunate that I practice in a very small area. And I say fortunate because with a small bar, I know all of the attorneys that practice in the area very well, and I've been lucky to find quite a few mentors that have helped me. Um, and especially in the past year and a few months that I've been on my own, it has been invaluable. I have a number of people, I, I don't be afraid to ask. I call and ask. I don't know how to do this motion. I don't know how to do this um, this particular thing for this judge. And everyone's been just so welcoming and bends over backward. And including, you know, having their secretaries and their paralegals help me with things. So I think that's my main thing is just don't be afraid to ask. I mean, the worst they can say is no, and I haven't gotten a no yet. So. <laughs> so I would add also, as you're looking for mentors, don't just look to lawyers. Um, the clerks in your courts know everything. <laughs> and I remember my first jury trial, which I had been out of law school about like three months or something, and 
I didn't prepare any jury instructions because I don't know. I took trial practice. I guess I wasn't paying attention. I, just heard <laughs> I thought that the judge. You weren't in the third year program. <laughs> And um, so there I was, was uh, uh, defending a 17-year-old who was beaten up, a, allegedly beaten up a security guard at uh, a precursor to Walmart. And I had no jury instructions. And the judge's secretary sat down and did them all for me in about 15 minutes. And she never stopped to this day. If a case comes up that's getting stricken from the docket for no activity for five years, she'll call me first and say, <clears throat> is it okay if we close this file? So. Critically important legal assistance. Legal assistance and secretary. <laughs> they really know a lot of stuff. They know yeah, a lot. We'll make things. sure that you have something filed on time. <laughs> and they, they know a lot. Yes. And they deserve a lot of respect. And they deserve a lot. Yes, absolutely. They deserve a lot of respect. Other comments on mentoring? If not, um, I would be remiss <coughs> if I did not ask this next question, so let's just get it out there and move through it before we move on to others. And that is, okay, the American Bar Association recently released statistics regarding women in the legal profession, which stated that only 34% of all attorneys in the United States are women, compared to 66% men. And right now, as I believe, the statistics are that um, significantly over half of the women in law schools, uh, I mean, students in law school are women. The, the disparity between female and male partners at law firms is even greater, with only 20% of all partners in private practice being women. There has long been a powerful perception, I think we could describe it as, uh, that women are riskier hires because they give up positions for parenthood. Um, it, perhaps that may be one of the reasons why women are not getting and keeping cho uh, top jobs. How do we confront this perception and how do we move forward to change those numbers? <laughs> um, how about we start with Kelly and then we'll... Yes, okay. Uh, Coming from a law firm where we're probably somewhere around the 20% mark in, in women partners, I, that's probably a fair question to me. Uh, it's not, you heard the earlier panel talk about, you know, when I first came out of law school, they weren't interviewing women. That's not the problem anymore. And, and it's not that, that there aren't jobs for women. That's, but if you look at incoming classes, and here I, I'm talking from the perspective of big law because, you know, that's, that's the sort of the, where the numbers are. You've heard a nice cross section of people who have forged their own path, and, and and lots of women who have done it. And so, really, the question is, you know, for the more traditional law firm path, you know, why is that still the statistics? <clears throat> it's not in who they hire. It's not in the opening day. Somewhere between entering the law firm and coming up in that critical window of time, seven to 10 years gets more like 10 years, gets more like 10 plus years at big firms, into crossing over into partnership, you're looking at numbers that are now like those statistics. And I can tell you, our firm does tons of stuff to look at that and study that. Kind of, why is that the case? And there isn't a single answer to why is that the case, which makes it a difficult and pernicious problem to deal with. Because it isn't one single thing that you can attack and make better. It's, it's, you know, for this person it was they were floundering in their career. They didn't have, it turns out they're great, but they never took the next step from, you know, what you expect as an associate where you sit back and wait for someone to ask you a question and you answer it to taking ownership of a case and taking leadership and a different set of skills over time as you mature. So that, that's true of men, that's true of women, and, and that takes away some of them. And some of it is they're making different family choices. And some of them, you know, they're getting sucked off into in-house counsel jobs. In-house counsel statistics, legal departments, may be slightly better in terms of their statistics than law firm statistics are. So they're sucking out our talent pool, right? Because they want to make their gender diversity numbers and minority diversity numbers. And so whatever law firms get and train up, they steal right out from under you, just at the point in life where people are looking for a little bit of relief on you know, what they might perceive about the hours of a traditional law firm practice. 
And those are perfectly legitimate choices to make. You wouldn't look back and say those are silly choices. Those are great, normal, healthy, professional choices to make. Um, but where I see the problem is needing to have more choices inside law firms. You need to have a bigger variety of options for people if you want to keep them. So you can't just have the single model that is the you know go for you know go for gold every single day for 10 million years and and you have to be everything to everybody and if you have a family work it in on the side you're going to have to have places where people can sort of scale back and re-enter right so they you hear them talk about it in the articles in the press as off ramps and on ramps <clears throat> but until you do that i don't know that you're going to change really move the needle on the statistics very far because you see people saying this isn't for me I'm going to make my own choices I'm going to crack my own career but that's fantastic and that's fabulous um, but you're not going to you're going to be left with the people inside a law firm and why is it more women that opt out than opt in you know millions and millions of choices and different things for different people and maybe it's feeling like an outsider maybe it's feeling like the big law firm is a little bit of a black box and it can be you can be there and go, I'm not quite sure how this is happening for them, and I don't know how it's happening for them. And when you can't see that, when it's not transparent, when you don't know how positions of leadership in the firm are selected, and you sit back, and you have to fill in the gap with your own reason, right? What's an easy reason to explain? Well, it's because I'm a woman, not because of something else. But if, if law firms aren't out there offering more transparency about how those decisions are made so that you can see it, see how I can go to A and B, and then pick it. I can pick it or not pick it when I can see it. But when you feel like it's a black box and you're not choosing it, then you will start self-selecting out. And again, you could, people in sociology and psychology fields can do gender studies and say, do women make those kind of self-selection out choices? Do they internalize negative messages more than men? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I can speculate about it. I can talk about myself personally. I might be more likely to sort of internalize something than to sort of, you know, bully through it. I may not have the ego that says, you know, well, you know, this be damned, I'm going to forge on through. Um, or I might. I don't know. But the numbers are still there. I think it's about, you know, a menu of options. And I think if law firms don't come up with having different options for people to come in and out and having something other than you must be everything, um, then, then they will change those numbers. And I can tell you that the market for hiring in law firms now is a hugely lateral market. So, you know, it's, it's less about hiring and growing up your own and keeping them up. It's, you know, sort of people shifting in between law firms. And, and the numbers that you hear, the 20%, you know, partner kind of numbers, you know, those are largely lateral hires, as I see it statistically. You know, they are undermining what you're doing in terms of what you're growing up. So you're hiring lots of women in your hiring class. But then when you look and say, well, the laterals who are coming in and coming in at partner level, oh my gosh, the numbers are horrible. I mean, they're just horrible. And again, why is that? Because they have transportable books of business. Why do just the men have transportable books of business? Or is it the men are more likely to be disloyal than the women? The women are going to be really loyal and they're going to stick where they are. I don't know, but I can tell you, in the lateral market, it's mostly men jumping around. I'm starting to see a few more like women. But one thing that I do inside my law firm at Stephanie Dark Castle, I interview from a risk management perspective anybody we're going to hire at a senior level, you know, either council or partnership level. So I do the interviews of every person we're considering as a lateral candidate. So I know they're all mostly men. <laughs> it's a lovely, refreshing thing when I get to hire, you know, talk to a woman. And so. Again, I have a woman who doesn't have small children, or she's already had them, and now she's lateral. <laughs> That's right. As I say, all, all, all of those things. But, but I think you know, I, I think that it's not necessarily a bad thing to look and say that women are crafting their own careers, and where they're having success is making their own path. For women in their lives, for them being happier people, for being successful professionals who can have more and not just, it's not as, I mean, you look at it and say that's a bad thing, it's a pernicious thing, and those statistics aren't right, and they need attention as to why they're happening. But it isn't necessarily an all bad thing that then women look and say, I will spread my wings and make my own path. Okay. Can I follow up on that? Um, I, I, I want to echo just a couple things that uh, Kelly has said. Um, she ended by saying it's not a bad thing, and you started talking a little bit about job satisfaction or intimating 
Um, those statistics don't mention a lot of um, important information from my perspective. Number one, it didn't talk about legal education. It talked about lawyers. And one thing that I've tried to do is encourage women, encourage anybody, to get a legal education. Because for me, that made a huge difference in my own sense of self-esteem. And, and that con continues to be something that's very important to me. It's not that I'm a lawyer. It's that I have a legal education. I'm not intimidated about buying a car or entering into a lease or helping my parents through all kinds of things they have to deal with as they are in their uh, older years. And that's something that I have because I have a legal education. So I know people who have pursued legal educations but aren't practicing law. Maybe they didn't take the law. Maybe they did, but they opted not to practice um, law. So that's one of the things that I was um, suggesting that we shouldn't we shouldn't overlook the fact that there may be other ways in which we can be productive and use our legal education, like that there are so many women in the legal profession that may not have a law degree or may not be practicing law. And I work with many people in the courts, uh, many people throughout the government, who are uh, absolutely critical to the functioning of our court system, but they're not uh, practicing lawyers. I also was thinking about um, the fact that uh, I think right now, maybe one of the uh, points that Kelly was making is that the, the law firm pretty much offers you that traditional uh, opportunity, whereas the non-law firm, this was private practice, this didn't talk about government, this didn't talk about public service, this didn't talk about any other options, education, uh, other fields that, that, you know, I know for me, my career has been not in private practice, uh, I did some, but I've left private practice and have either been government or courts. Um, the other thing it doesn't talk about is the time period. So in my experience, I'm encountering um, many um, women in their 50s and 60s who are very uh, successful, including more women on the bench in their 50s and 60s. So you may find someone you're 10 years out, um, uh, perhaps the uh, perhaps male uh, lawyers may be more uh, commonly on that 45 degree angle trajectory and so they are um, at a certain point when they're in their mid-30s, whereas perhaps a woman might be on a different um, uh, path, um, or it may not be that you know, 45 degree angle, it may be a different angle, it may be you know, sideways for a while and then it goes up, um, because it may be that in your 30s you're doing something different, but then in your 40s or 50s you're the judge. So I, I think that, that the statistics don't talk about job satisfaction, they don't talk about uh, your self-esteem, um, and they don't talk about areas that are non-traditional private practice, and they don't talk about who has the legal education. <clears throat> so I, I think it's still a good thing. We may need to work, I totally agree, that law firms need to have more options. Because think of how many women have gone out on their own and been very successful because they didn't have those options in the, in the law firm. But thank goodness women go out on their own and take advantage of all these options. Because I see them now in my court, and. I'm one of those who did something different and now have this fantastic opportunity. I love my job. That's great. I, I would like to uh, pick up on uh, the choices that, that, you know, the law firms, I think, traditionally have been under this 200-year-old two, model. Um, and um, that, in my view, has to change in order to keep women. Uh, from a, just a purely biological point of view, uh, the men don't have the issue that women have, and that is that there's only a finite number of years in which you're able to have children. And it, it's interesting that if a man has a family and he's working at a firm, he's considered to be stable and committed. Uh, on the other hand, if a woman has children and working at the firm, she might not be as committed. She's going to, her career is going to be interrupted perhaps by not being able to dedicate as much time to the firm. And I think that bespeaks a, a, a mindset that needs to change and needs to change from the top down. And so to hear Kelly talk about more choices, uh, I think from the top down that has to be a priority for a large firm if they're going to keep the talented pool of women that they invest in initially for them to stay because there are so many other um, constraints that women deal with that men do not deal with as much or as frequently or as regularly. 
And so to have choices to opt in, opt out, to take this track or that track, and still remain a part of the viability of the firm and still have that option at some point of coming in as an equity partner um, is, is very important to retaining talented women. Otherwise, what talented women are going to leave the firm that, that you've invested in and they're going to do something different. That they're going to teach or they're going to uh, do something in government law uh, that will be more uh, life satisfying to them so that they can have the life that they want to have. Leaving the law firm was my offer. Uh, I, I knew that I was only going to get, I wanted to have my second child. I knew I was only going to get two weeks in maternity leave. That's what I was offered. And I realized that I could work for myself. Um, take eight weeks, work some of that time while I had the baby from my house and, um, and make it work and that's why my husband and I decided to make the decision that I would go out on my own. Um, I don't regret it at all. Um, I, I think I faced some different barriers to being in a small community and it's a little more old fashioned in Martinsville. Um, the firm I was in it had four male partners. Um, all of the women that work there are paralegals, they're all called secretaries. Um, and that's how it's always been. Um, and, I, and I was there for three years, and there was never a change in my responsibilities or what I was doing. So I kind of realized very, um, after a couple years, that I was going to have to kind of force my own road. And that's what I did by starting my So I want to make sure people understand that inside a big law firm, there is still room to forge your own road. I find that the ones that do it are the ones that, that have a vision of what they want, a clear vision of what they want. They're not waiting for it to be offered to them or thought of for them, and then they ask for it. Uh, and, and when that works, it's because they have established themselves as somebody who has a lot to offer. And, and when that's true, and you ask for it, and you know what you want, uh, it will work out. It just takes more and more people doing it to create role models who have done it, to give confidence to the next set of people to do it. I mean, sitting here, when I had my first child, I was an associate, I was a pretty senior associate, I was probably a year from the window opening on partnership, and I, you know, I looked around, I was in the litigation section, if not necessarily the, the most women-heavy section of the firm, and I was looking you know, in Richmond, looking around going, okay, what woman has come in as an associate, had a baby, come back and still made partner? And I wanted to see that, I wanted to, not because I didn't think I couldn't do it if no one else had, it just would have made me feel better. It would have given me a level of confidence. It would have allayed the fears. I've probably heard exactly what you heard today, which is, you know, there's no great time to have a baby. But knowing that intellectually and getting that comfort level to take the leap are two different things. If you're surrounded by people who took the leap, it's easier to take the leap. And, you know, so again, it, it, it's sort of looking around as the generations go, you know, since the time I was looking around saying who's done that, you know, now I know who's done it. Now the associates who have started and have come up, you know, in, in the past decade could look around, and they don't have to look far and, and wide. They know who to look to. They, they have women who have done it as role models. Whether they're mentors or not, they're just out there showing you there are other choices, there are, you can have the confidence that it can be done. Do any of you have any suggestions for things that we in legal education can do to help our students be more prepared to now to face this? Well, first and foremost, I think that, you know, that, um, no, honing in on your skills. Because what I think what you've heard from the, the both panels is that if, if, you, um, if you are good at what you do, you will be successful. It, it, it is true. You may have certain lifestyle challenges, but we really don't have true gender challenges today. It's lifestyle challenges, I, I think, are, are what's more common. And so as long as you um, have the skills, um, from, from my perspective, it, it, it doesn't matter the gender of the lawyer. If they didn't prove the facts, they're not going to win the case. And if they didn't win the case, that client's going to go to another lawyer. And if that lawyer doesn't win the case, they're going to find another lawyer, regardless of the gender of the lawyer. So I would really focus on being the best lawyer you can be. And then these other questions are more practical questions about, about how to do the balance and how the lifestyle works. But I'm not really sure the law school can do anything more than what they're currently doing about bringing out, uh, putting out good students. But I, 
I have to follow up on one thing you said, which I don't know if they're really true, like gender challenges. <coughs> I'm going to articulate this in a devil's advocate mode because I don't know where I come down on it. And this goes back to the, you know, when, when you're not sure why something happened, how do you fill in <coughs> the answer to why or how it happened? There are still times where I might sit in a meeting and ideas are being exchanged around the table and I'll contribute an idea and it'll seem to be, have not been heard. And 10 minutes later, Mr. Fellow down there says the same idea and, and suddenly it's a great idea and I'm going, hmm. So am I a bad advocate? Am I bad at articulating myself? Was the group just not ready to hear and digest the idea yet? Or could they not hear me because uh, my voice is a woman's voice? I don't know, right? The, the, the easy thing for me to do might be to say they can't, the, in that instance, that group of people couldn't hear my voice, it was a woman's voice. And I have those moments. I have those moments where I feel like that is true in my soul, that that's what's happening. But that doesn't mean that's true. <laughs> that's just my perception. That's my internal messaging, right? And, and what you have to do is sort of challenge yourself to say what, you know, what really was going on there. Did I articulate it clearly? Because then I'll improve my skills and make them even better. Even if, they, you know, if I thought they were great before, now let's make them even better. Maybe they weren't what I thought they were. And I gotta be able to take that back in and hear that and change it, because that's the part I can do something about. Um, part of me can just rejoice that my solution solved the problem and I'll take personal pleasure in that, right? You know, part of it might be just in, Interpersonal dynamics, you learn a lot as you practice law. And this goes back to your question, believe it or not, which what can the law school do? There's a part of practicing law that isn't just about what you know in legal skills. It's about learning about these interpersonal human dynamics. That's what it is to counsel clients. That's what it is to collaborate with your team, is to learn these things they study in business school, right? These things about, you know, What's a group dynamic and how do you best make use of the, you know, the fact that this person was great on data and this person is, can't hear anybody else's ideas and yet how do you pull out the best of all those people? And that's what diversity is really about, right? Not just gender and not just race, but that you have something different to offer at the table. I don't need 10 people working on my case who all think and act and dress the same way. If I can think of it, I don't need you. I need you to think of the things I can't think of, and that's what your clients need you to be able to do. So what can you do as law schools is, is to sort of teach that ability to collaborate, and I think your practicum is a wonderful step in that direction. And what can you do as law schools is sort of bring that self-knowledge and interpersonal dynamics and that aspect that isn't just knowing the law and practicing law, but it is that how do you collaboratively work? How do you counsel people? How do you get more knowledge and experience and self-awareness uh, in these dynamics that are much squishier than what are the facts and what are the what's the law? This makes me think of several things and I don't even know which order to put them out. But you're talking about that. I read not long ago that Google is constantly struggling with the fact that, and it is a, a corporation that has a lot of really smart programmers working for them. They tend to be homogeneous. And that's really having effect on the workplace. And they are trying as a corporation to increase the diversity among their workforce, but they keep hiring white people because they need those skills in part. But they also need other things besides just the technical programming skills, and so watching a corporation of that size struggle with issues that we're all struggling with about how to, how to create more diversity, whatever we mean by diversity. So, um, yeah, point taken. But the, the point that leads to another question, and then this is a little bit the reverse side, because I'm quite sure that Kelly is able of holding her own at any table. <laughs> but for years, for years, the law school struggled, and not just us, but legal education struggled, with the fact that in many times, we could not get women to participate in class. They were very capable, knew the answer, simply would not talk um, for a host of reasons. Um, which I won't elaborate at the point, but um, we would find that women would not reach for the brass ring. I 
had research assistants who just simply did not turn in their write on competition and it was just, uh, you know, didn't want to fail. And so I think we moved some beyond that, but not entirely. And I'm wondering if you're encountering still women. Your point was, you speak at the table, not heard. But I'm wondering if you all are experiencing the fact that women won't ask for a difficult assignment or speak up in opposition to something that they see needs attention. Um, okay. I, think I, think where, I think this is where it starts when uh, the difference between little boys and little girls is so pronounced. Um, I have coached soccer when my son and daughter played soccer. I have coached t-ball when my son played t-ball. And the risk that little boys are willing to take from the get-go is so much greater than the risk little girls are willing to take. They don't want to, the girls don't want to take the risk of failing. And if, if you're going to be successful in life, you have to take a risk, or two, or three. And you have to be prepared to fail. There is no shame in coming up short and failing. If you've given it your very best shot, no matter what it is that you do, you, there is no shame in failing. The shame is not taking the risk. You, you can't hit the home run if you're not up at the plate. That's what I tell my son. You can't hit the home run if you're not there, honey. And he'd walk up there, and he couldn't hit a curveball to save his life. <laughs> <laughs> he gave it his very best shot every time, every time, because he wanted to hit that home run. And when he'd come back and sit on the bench, I'd say, good job. And he would be, you know, tears in his eyes, and I'd say, you get it the next time. And that's the resiliency that you must have. And if then little girls need to know that from the very beginning. And if they're, if they're uncomfortable with that attitude, then the law schools need to cultivate it. Because the trial work, big firm practice, courtroom practice, there's a lot at stake there. And success is not necessarily something you see quickly. But to take the risk and to learn and to become better and hone your skills and develop yourself that's risky behavior, but it's the only way you become successful. So law schools, in my view, need to cultivate that attitude in women. That, that, that a risk, it's okay to fail. It's not okay not to take the risk. I, I wholly second that. I think that what you're saying is true as a general, like generally men, generally women. I will say I grew up, I had three brothers. Um, late in, after I got to the place where I was in law school, my mother remarried and I got three stepbrothers. And now that I have children, I have two boys. <laughs> and I work in litigation where people, you know, this and it's more men than women. So, you know, obviously, if you look at me and, and you know, what, what am I likely to do or shy away from, I might, I might be a little aberrational in that regard, but you heard me earlier say, but I also might internalize things in a way, not, not withstanding the fact that I'm willing to engage in that behavior, there's this internal messaging that's going on inside my head anyway. Um, if I'm allowed to put Jennifer on the spot, she was in the third year practicum that we taught in the fall, which was primarily, it was more men than women in the class. Um, who, dom who dominated the conversation in the class? The men. The men, I mean, I noticed that, right? But I noticed that the men dominated. I talked about that with my colleagues when we taught the class. You know, where are the women here in this conversation? We, we knew their work product was out there. We, we knew, you know, but, but, you know, you're saying it as a historic fact. I was still experiencing it and wondering why is that the case. She can tell me in front of everybody, if you like, that there was something we as professors were doing that made that, you know, uh, something that was uncomfortable, and I, I will call out Professor Murchison over there as being the model of a professor who makes it comfortable to put yourself out there. There is not a word that you can utter in his classroom that he doesn't make sound like you just said the most <laughs> And so, you know, if, if your professors in your third year practicum weren't great at that, 
um, then shame on us, and you should tell us that in your evaluation. But what can law schools do? You know, they can make that safe for everybody to take risk. They can make sure that they insist on you know, that dialogue, and that when it happens, there is a positive experience out of it, not a negative one. On the other hand, right, if you don't engage in that behavior of failing and having it hurt and overcoming it and persisting beyond it and just being relentless about it, you probably will filter yourself out in some way because, you know, you look at pro athletes, you know, who have great batting averages and they fail the vast majority of the time, right? A good batting average is like maybe one in three. That's really, you know, imagine in your life and in your career that you get negative feedback, you know, two out of the three times you, you try something. That's not so fun. You got into law school because you got great grades all the way through high school. You got positive feedback all the way through college. And in law school, you're probably really good students and getting a lot of great feedback. Maybe not as much. And when you get out of practice, you're going to take a beating. You're going to take a beating. And so, yes, we should nurture it, and yes, we should make it comfortable for you to put yourself out there, but you do have to develop that persistence and that willingness to sort of get through the disappointing, I'm going to cry in the bathroom moments. I, I cry, cry in the bathroom. I cry in the bathroom. <laughs> and, and confidence comes with experience. I mean, I, I, you know, I still struggle with that on a daily basis. I still, my husband will, since he's an attorney too, we have an interesting perspective because he talks to judges and other attorneys um, and they say, oh, this judge gave you the best compliment. And it surprises me still, I mean, at this point, that, oh, me? I, I did a good job? Um, I think the only thing that, for me, with the self-confidence that really helps me every day when I go into court is I have to focus on my preparation and my organization. And if I have those two things and I know that I've done everything to be prepared, um, I go in there and I feel like, okay, I've done all I can, so now let's just see how this, um, how this happens. But I still struggle with it. And I did, I wish, kind of wish we could go and do law school um, now, like at 35. I think I would have had much more of an appreciation now if I could go do those three years than I did 10 years ago when I started. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the way our countries <laughs> work. Picking up on, on a couple of things that you that you said, I think that um, Judge Talevi's point about taking risks um, is probably one of the best takeaways that, that I hope that you'll get for us from today. Um, and what some of the things that we can do, uh, maybe not the law school, but that we can do in the profession is, you know, as um, uh, women in the field, either through associations or just through informal uh, gatherings and, and um, uh, connections. We need to support uh, those of us who want to take risks. Um, a couple things that um, uh, you may be encountering uh, and that, that I can relate to is that it may seem as if uh, what it is that you have to do is something that may come easily to the guy who wants to go up to bat and, you know, and, and, and hit the home run, um, but I may not be athletic and so I may be thinking I have to go up to bat and hit the home run. It reminds me of something that my father had said to me um, when I was in college and I was uh, going to a, a job interview. Um, at the time, it was, it was about what to wear, and it was back when it was the boxy, <laughs> yes, I, I story. the boxy look, and it was either the, you know, the navy blue boxy suit or the brown boxy suit. And um, so I was struggling with what to wear, and what I had was I had the the, the pink suit that was the Easter Sunday, um, doesn't have a collar, um, fitted look. Um, and I said, you know, I really want to wear the pink suit. That's my favorite suit. I, I really like it. I can't wear that to a job. I've got to wear the brown suit. And my father said to me, you don't have to be a man to get this job. You don't have to look like a man to get the job. So he said, wear the pink suit. <laughs> it looks good. You like it. You'll feel good. So I did. Of course, I didn't get the job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but it's after that, I realized that you know, to take a risk might be to go out there and do something. But I'm going to do it differently because I'm female. What I find is that in um, you know, in some settings, there is the um, the you know, the, the bold litigator comes in and he can you know, puff out the chest and he can you know, pound his fist on the, the podium and he can make that point. If I try to do that, 
I look like a fool. So I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take the risk to go into court, but I'm going to do it the way that, that Jennifer's done that. And I'm going to do that by, by being prepared so I'm comfortable that I know what I'm talking about. And it's not going to be funny like this. It's going to be my approach. And what I find is that sometimes when I was at the podium, the judges would actually lean in. Maybe they couldn't hear me. That might have been part of it. But I also found that there tended to be just a little bit of body language of, oh, hmm. Because I had a, an approach that might have been a little bit more nurturing, a little bit more um, less, less aggressive, less competition, less assertive. So whatever your approach is, it's OK. And so if you are not comfortable in an environment that is you know, very masculine, that's okay. You can still get out there, take the risk, but do it with what is comfortable with you. Wear the pink suit if that's what you want to do. Um, and then what we need to do, I think, is we need to, to help those who are taking risks. Because there will be times when you do get emotional and you're worried about, how do I deal with this? Do I run into the bathroom because I feel like I'm going to cry? That's the kind of thing you can call an experienced woman lawyer about some friend who's been in the field and say, how did you deal with that? I think we can, we can all help that um, so that you will continue to want to get up there. Have a, have a place to pretend that you, you can do it. And, and I, one of the things I, I also tell you is that I find that I have a lot of cheerleaders in other men who are so tickled that, you know, that, oh my goodness, she's made it. And so they want <laughs> so much to help me out. They've got a daughter, they've got a wife, they've got a sister, they've got a mother. And so they really will cheer you on, but they may not be able to answer the specific question of, gee, what do I do when I'm emotional? What do I do when you know, I I'm afraid because I'm not going to be successful? So you know what? I I I'm not going to take on that, that, that difficult case. I'm not going to make a, a suggestion of committee. Those are the things you reach out to the women about. And we'll be there. I think you're sounding good. And don't be afraid to ask for the tough assignment. When there are several opportunities for work in your summer positions, that's how you'll get known too. Mm -hmm. um, you do a good job on that, and when it comes time to decide who stays, who gets an offer at the end of the summer, will be the person who stepped up to the plate, who did good work, who made the connections by appearing in somebody's <laughs> office, say hey, hello, or good morning, or whatever. So, um, one of the things that um, you just said made me turn to another question, right. which uh, is, uh, and this could be for a uh, well, maybe we we'll start with uh, one, um, and this is one, the word feminism has recently been listed as one of Merriam-Webster's top ten words of the year. Oh, I thought that was true. <laughs> okay, apparently it's true. I'm accepting it as true for the moment. <laughs> Sheryl Sandberg's bestseller, Lean In, stresses the importance of feminism in today's workplace by leaning in or making small conscious decisions to bridge gender barriers. What do you think about that? Have, you, yeah. uh, have any of you read Lean In? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to <laughs> Okay, I haven't. All right, sorry to put you on the spot. Well, you went past it. You were just trying to sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> My main focus in my law practice right now is um, I mostly am a guardian ad litem, which means I represent children um, who have been victims of abuse or neglect or sometimes in custody battles. And I think um, the feminine side of me is really what makes me so good at this at this work. Um, I'm on the front lines with these children. I go to homes that when I leave, I want to throw clothes away. Um, I meet with them in their schools. I've been to hospitals. Um, and I think the nurturing side of me, the empathetic side, um, my sensitivity, it works in, in that area. And, and that's why I love to do it so much. So um, I think that, and I also do some criminal defense, and it's the same thing there when it comes to sentencing. I'm able to look at a whole family perspective. This isn't just the person that committed a crime. He has um, a whole background that has led up to this and a family dynamic that's contributed to it. Um, and I think that's part of my feminine perspective. And just as a mom, I can, I, you know, he has a mom. He's a dad to somebody else. Um, so I don't know if that particularly relates to that, but, but that's the feminist perspective that I see in what I do every day. Uh, well, I have read the book, and um, I sent it to my daughter, who is living in Paris, and uh, 
She I'm says, so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I want to go visit, but with all this craziness with these planes, I don't know. I, I, I never have been a big uh, person to fly anyway. But um, I sent her the book, and she sent. Uh, uh, she she called me and she said, "Gee, mom, this." This is about you and the strong women that you associate with. And I think her point was this, not that I'm a great mom, but her <laughs> point, I'd like to think that I am, but you know, uh, I think her point was this, that you, you go out into this business of being a lawyer, and that's what it is, that you must be able to uh, be confident about yourself that you must take risk, and that you must look for opportunities to promote yourself. I think so often uh, women uh, stand back and, and just kind of let uh, other people promote themselves uh, in a way uh, that tends to leave women on the margins. And I would urge you not to do that. Uh, Kelly mentioned earlier, I want it. That's not a bad thing to say. Put your Make sure you are skilled and organized and that you are ready to make that statement and that you can back it up with your work, work ethic and your knowledge. But don't be afraid to say that. There is nothing wrong with saying, I want it. When I went on the bench in 1996, the leaders of the bar in the area came to me and said, we have a position open. Do you think you, we'd like to we'd like to run for it? And I said, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And I thought to myself, what don't you know? <laughs> what don't you know? You practiced law for 13 years. Before that, you were a probation officer. You graduated from, from undergraduate school. You graduated from law school. You've been practicing law every day in the courtrooms. What don't you know? Why are you hesitating? And I thought, I don't know. I'm afraid to take the risk, but by golly, I'm going to throw my hat in. And I haven't looked back since. And that's been a great um, model for my children. And it's been um, a, a sense of accomplishment for me as well. But it's been a great model for other women who are coming along in the Roanoke area. Uh, male lawyers will send their uh, sometimes uh, law partners or in small firms or sometimes their friends who are starting out as lawyers who are women. Uh, Jackie, would you talk with this, with this woman about how it is to be a lawyer here in the Roanoke Valley? And I guess they see me as senior now. I hate that term. <laughs> but I guess, that's what I guess that's the reason that they're referring uh, these uh, women to me. And it's a, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to talk about the practice of law in the Roanoke Valley with younger women who are struggling to get into the practice. But the point is that you can't be afraid, and you must be confident in your accomplishments. Because as Kelly pointed out, you're not dopes. You're here. You're being successful. And it's because you are bright, and you are capable, and you are talented. And for heaven's sake, if you don't believe it, who's going to? You need to play your own trumpet and play it loud and step up, lean in, whatever the phraseology is. But you need to uh, make sure that you are uh, saying, those th saying those things to the right people. Yes, I'll do that. I want that. Yes, I I'll take that assignment. So that you promote yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think too often we think somehow there is something wrong. Maybe that's cultural, maybe that's uh, you know, the way little girls are brought up, I'm not sure. But in my view, in the business world, in the man's world, because that's what business is about thus far, uh, they don't hesitate to say, I want it. They step up and say, I'll take it. And let me tell you what, if you're the person that hears that and believes it, but know yourself well enough to know that you're still uncomfortable with it, and that you need a couple baby steps in that direction before you're ready to do it directly, then begin to develop strategies to do it indirectly. Do it for other people enough times, and they'll start to do it for you. This person's really good at that. Think of them. Be the person that points out other people who are good at things when it's honest, when it's true, right? And, and be the person for somebody else, because a lot of times we're good advocates for others, and we're not great advocates for ourselves. And then, you know, even if you, you know, 
say it, you know, plan you're going to that social networking thing, you're going with your buddy, and the two of you talk about the fact that, hey, you know, I think at this, and so like when we're talking to these people, could you say, yeah, she's really good at this, and I'll say she's really good at that. <laughs> you know, we, we had, we, we, our firm paid money, big money, to send one of our associates down to an industry conference, and the specific plan was her to go with this other person, and they talked about each other as their wingman. They, I mean, they, this was a, a on-the-table conversation, express understanding that we're going to be each other's wingman, and be able to talk about what we know they do well. Right? So if you're not good at this yet, and you, you're right, you've got to get good at it, but you may not be able to make that leap the first time, you need to do it for others, and you need to, to do some strategic things. Do what you're comfortable with. Maybe it's, I'm going to a meeting where I know they're going to talk about assignments. Find the person you're comfortable with. Tell them, man, if this comes up, I'd really like it. And make sure somebody at the table knows it, even if it's not in the group dynamic. Get, it, get ahead of it. Get ahead of it before the meeting happens. And position someone who will say for you, this person's the right person for it. So you know, work those connections. Work those things you're comfortable with. Work toward being totally comfortable with doing it at the table in the big group. But if you can't make that leap right away, there are some other sort of less, you know, less comfortable, less uncomfortable ways to come about it. If I could just give a couple of uh, points along those lines. Um, you know, we, we talked about um, uh, comparing reference to business school. Um, and what I thought about um, when Mr. Lady mentioned that is that I think we can, we can actually learn a little bit from uh, those who come out of business school. They, they learn certain traits. And one of them is conversational traits. Um, and I think that sometimes with women, one of the, the um, obstacles we have is how to make good, easy, small talk. Especially if we're not going to talk about sports, um, or we don't want, you know, don't know everything about military history or something like that, have at your arsenal certain um, kind of uh, neutral subjects. Maybe it's um, history, or it's travel, or it's geography, or just you know, some interesting science factoids. But have those kinds of um, conversational um, uh, topics. Um, uh, ready for you to be able to, to offer. And sometimes what you might find is once you're talking about this neutral subject, some historical um, you know, uh, event, um, that that makes you a little bit more comfortable in general with yourself. And then others would begin to see that you know, this is somebody who knows what they're talking about. And then you might find that others really want to hear what you have to say. And that might help you to then move to the next step of, well, I can really help you with this project. Well, maybe I will go ahead and volunteer for, for that activity. Um, it's just a matter of not being intimidated because, gee, how do I interrupt this conversation about baseball? I really like baseball. You don't have to. When there's a segue, you can begin to talk about something else that you know, might be something that you can actually talk about. But that's not about. I think what Monica's point about, you know, sometimes we do find ourselves wasting an opportunity because we're in this meeting and we want to talk about diets. I'm sorry, it's not going to make a difference to the, to the general group if you just want to talk about diets. Um, I, I know a, a, that kind of thing happening. Or, um, or, you, or you get something, you know, it's, it's uh, some other sort of a petty or catty kind of conversation. Instead, you want to be able to show people that, you, that you're intelligent, that you know what you're talking about, and that you can talk about more than maybe just work. Um, but then, because you can talk about more than just work, they will maybe want to talk to you about work. Another thing you might want to do is try to get involved in uh, continuing with education. They are always looking for folks, and the more that you're willing to just do the work, uh, they'll give you an opportunity to, to speak and to meet other speakers and to, to meet other lawyers. Um, and that was something that I found beneficial I was one of those people that was afraid to speak up. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm still that way. And well, maybe not today, but, um, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I remember uh, being at a, a certain organization where I, I was asked to speak, so I gave some training. And one of the um, uh, heads of the organization came up to me afterwards and said, Rebecca, where have you been? He said, you come to these meetings and you sit in the back of the room. I had no idea you knew all this. <laughs> it was about some particular topic regarding bankruptcy trustees. <laughs> um, but um, what, what I found was that um, once you start doing some maybe continuing education or, or some other activities, people will know 
that you know what you're talking about, and then what they will do is they will want to hear what you have to say, and they'll tell others, you need to hear her. You want to hear what she has to say. And that was something that was said to me, and it um, made a big difference in my life. It was a, a mentor, a friend who, you know, wringing my hands, I'm so nervous, you know, I don't know. And he stopped, stopped me and he said, people want to hear what you have to say. Stop, stop acting so uh, uh, intimidated. So, uh, so go for it. I think you can, um, I think you can be, um, I think you can develop the confidence to volunteer for the difficult cases, to, to seek out um, what you want, to be willing to say what you want, maybe by taking the baby steps, uh, you know, honing in your, your conversational skills on some neutral, interesting topics, and then volunteer for continuing education and just know your stuff. I have to tell us, hear you say that, tell a story of myself. Professor Shaughnessy will tell you that there is one section of civil procedure that all the years that I taught admiralty it works just the opposite in the admiralty, but I could not learn this. I mean, I could learn it long enough to teach it, and then I would forget it between the times that I had to teach it in admiralty. And on one occasion, I was um, asked if I would represent Washington and Lee um, at the session which is held the day after a bar exam where each school sends a representative and we collectively talk about what the answers to the bar exam should be. And I'm sitting there and I've read this question and I'm just sitting there going, oh my gosh, this is that section. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept talking, talking, talking and I'm thinking, they're wrong. Really wrong. But if I raise my hand, I might be expected to explain and, ooh, I'll embarrass myself and I'll embarrass the university if I don't get it right like the first time. But you just kept talking, and I finally thought, you've got to answer this. So I just raised my hand, and I said, I think this is a section, so it's no problem. Dead silence, and I thought, oh, I'm sunk. <laughs> and then some professor from Richmond said, Oh my gosh, it really is. And he got so excited that he laid out all the answers I never could see. <laughs> <laughs> so, fortunately, I did not ignore that. <laughs> so. But you could have. <laughs> but I could have. And that wouldn't have been the end of the world. It would exactly. not have been the end of the world. So that it would have just corrected me and said, Oh, you were so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> As we would want to do. Um, that's okay, just go with it. I can just do. Um, and one more comment about what we've just been talking about. There is still such a disparity uh, in the numbers of women who appear in state legislatures or who appear on the bench. And we heard your story about stepping up to the risk. Maybe we just need to buy a bunch of copies of Lean In. And every time we get together, we talk about how good someone else is and see if we can I have a great many more questions that I would love to direct to my esteemed guests, but I have been directed that I am supposed to conclude this portion of our discussion and open the floor for questions. So, do any of you, I actually have more questions if you don't, but do any of you have, yes. <coughs>
Your face is about here. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, 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 this is not a dodge truth. My face was barely over. <laughs> and so um, I said to the clerk next to me, you know, again, you have to be nimble and you have to act like, oh, this is just exactly what I thought was going to happen. I said, would you hand me a couple of cookbooks, please? And she said, what? I said, would you hand me a couple of cookbooks? I put them under my bottom, I sat down, I then could see everybody, and within 30 minutes my bottom was asleep. I had no idea whether, where my legs were or anything when I sat and finished the rest of the docket. And then when the uh, room was clear, I said to the deputy, I said, you may have to help me stand up because my bottom and my legs are asleep. Everybody got the laugh out of it, but uh, yeah, the chair was off. So it's not so horrible. horrible. I switched them. I mean, every time, and, and I'm a substitute judge now, so I go to different courts. And every time I go, I usually know what chairs are what in which court. And I switch them for um, an off a chair like this, an office chair, a chair that will sit up straight. Yeah. And right, it's just it's just a uh, hidden answer. Yes, it is. A when I was appointed to the faculty, my predecessor in the library was a very tall man. And the chair was huge, larger than any one of these. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I could sit cross-legged in the chair and not touch either side. <laughs> and my feet did not touch the floor. And they literally did not touch the floor. Yes, having the other problem, too. So I went to the then dean, and I said, you just asked me to run a library with a huge staff and a lot of money. And, and I feel like Edith Ann. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys know. Oh, Edith yeah. Ann was a, a character created by Lily Tomlin, a great comedian who, who talked about this whose character was this small child in this enormous rocking chair. And I said, I, I have no confidence <laughs> in, in doing all of this because my feet won't touch the floor. May I have a new, may I buy a new chair? <laughs> and he told me, I could buy a new chair if then I traded that there was someone new, new in the dean of students on campus who was a very tall man. So he got this gorgeous leather chair and he bought a new chair for me that I could reach yeah. the floor. So, <laughs> yeah, chairs are important. Okay, questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I would like to ask about something that I noticed between the two stories of uh, Judge Ward's pantsuit and Judge Connolly's pink suit. How do we, how do we reconcile the, the disparity, the seeming disparity between those two stories where, on the one hand, you want to conform to these ideals to make your superiors more comfortable and to fit into the culture of a law firm or an office. And on the other hand, being an individual, being yourself, being female. Well, I, I've actually had this on my mind lately. Uh, now you realize that, that I sit in a part of Virginia that's not the height of urban sophistication. <laughs> The new women coming into practice law, bless their hearts, <laughs> they're wearing heels this high, and they're having, they're exhibiting cleavage. Sort of like the good wife or something. And, and, and that's not real. Remember when my daughter was little, she watched that show, 92710, <laughs> and every day I go in there and say, you know this isn't real, right? <laughs> That's not real. And just last week, I was talking to an attorney, a, a female attorney between cases. We were chatting, and she told, she's probably, she's probably 35 years old, very um, attractive young woman. And she told me she quit wearing dresses and skirts because two of the judges, one of which we discussed earlier today, uh, just kept staring at her all the time in a creepy kind of way. And now she dresses, well, she's gone way, way, way in the other direction. And um, so I don't think this is an obsolete thing. I mean, you don't. If you want to be taken seriously, you need to dress like a serious person. I mean, I know a lawyer in Grayson County, Virginia, you've probably never even heard of Grayson County. He goes to New York twice a year and he <coughs> buys three and four thousand dollar suits. And I'm telling you, it makes him look smarter. <laughs> it really does. 
Now, I, I never did that, but um, uh, I can go over real well in bankruptcy court. <laughs> And then you get pregnant, and then you look like crap. <laughs> I don't think that um, you want to wear anything that would that would make the issue what you're wearing instead right. of what you're saying. So whatever it is, if it's noisy shoes or noisy jewelry or some weird hat, I don't know what it is. If whatever it is, whether you're male or female, if if it's so distracting and making people wonder, what is, how did they get that? <laughs> and not thinking about what you're saying. That's true. And it happens to judges. We're human. And so if I want to listen to what you're telling me, and I'm trying to figure out how in the world you got drove here wearing that, you know, <laughs> then I'm not going to pay attention to you, are you? I, I'd like to take this past dressing, because I think, I think with, with clothing, especially if you're in court, conservative is best, and then branch out slowly. Same thing in a law firm. Dress conservatively at first, and then sort of branch out. But I would like to take this to um, building your credibility in other areas. For example, as a young associate in the firm, keep your powder dry. You know, um, pick your battles. I had some clients, they were they actually wonderful old gentlemen, octogenarians that owned a company from Arkansas, and they insisted on calling me Miss Mary. And and I could have made an issue about that, right. but I didn't, because I knew that that was, just, that was their way. And they for them, they were being respectful. And they listened to me, and they listened to me. So so it's the same thing in, um, you know, in, in, in meetings, in firm meetings, in meetings, bar association <coughs> meetings, in in court, pick your battles, decide what's important. If in doubt, uh, do something that's least likely to make waves. And then when you do have an issue that becomes important, people are much more likely to listen to you. When, when, uh, when my partner and I started practicing, as I said, we were the first women, and, um, we did a lot of real estate work, and we're down in the clerk's office looking through all the real estate books, and all the lawyers are down there, and everybody gossips and chats and carries on. And right away, we heard a lot of racist jokes and a lot of uh, inappropriate sexual jokes. And we, she and I, and then at one point, we had heard that some lawyer was telling some banker not to send us work. Um, she and I talked about it and decided what we were going to do. We didn't just do it right then. And what we did is we went to talk to five different men together and just told them, well, the one that was trying to take our business, who was a very dear friend of mine now, but um, we told him we knew about it and we didn't like it and he needed to stop. And we said, okay. And as to the racist and sexist jokes, we just, every time we heard them, we say, you know, guys, come on. Yeah. you got to reconstruct you. I mean, really, you, know, you can sometimes do it with a little bit of humor. Like, I mean, like yeah. hey, come on, you know. That's right. That's, that's, but you know what, they stopped. Yeah. And when I started, the, our bar association had a picnic every year. One of the lawyers had it. And we had heard about this. And I think it was basically a staff party. I mean, the glasses that you drank out of when you poured something liquid, the clothes came off the girl. <laughs> and the light switch for the basement um, room where the pool tables oh, yeah. were oh, yeah. was the guy with the raincoat with the switch that went up and down. <laughs> and it was, it was really old school in a really bad way. But we went. We just got a few more minutes, so I thought we might yeah. take some more questions. If you just got to go, and you know what? It changes. Mm -hmm. It changes. Um, well, I'll just introduce myself. I'm a sixth year at Sutherland, Aspel, and Brennan, so I'll give it to you any context. On the clothes thing, I'm just going to weigh in from my own personal experience. It is equally as painful to see the person who's never worn a stitch of makeup in their life show up with red lipstick on mm -hmm. for a law school air or for a summer associate interview. Don't do it. Inside mm -hmm. your comfort zone, know what you can wear. I mean, it sounds silly, and it's one of those 
women's things, but she improves your friend, you know? <laughs> Use your concepts. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Um, I guess thinking back to something Kelly said, um, I do MMA. Um, it, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've been called honey, I've been called dear. Somebody at some point offered to buy me a hoop skirt. Um, but again, you pick your battles. You know, you laugh and you say, you know, only if you will watch God the wind with me. Um, <laughs> you know, you, being a female, I think where I am is a double edged sword. <coughs> I recognize there are no senior associates above me in my group who are female. The closest person to me who's a female is a first year. So I see that as great power because <laughs> I know that there are 19, 20% female workers. Maybe I'll get over the hump, maybe I won't, but that's a pretty great place to be in. And if I can present myself well and do a good job and put myself out there and not be afraid to fail, that's great. I think the one thing that I didn't hear any of you all talk about, and I wonder if you just didn't talk about it or if you just don't see it the way I see it, is there's still an attitude out there about with um, the first year is pregnant. And the comment was made, well, I guess she'll be taking time off this year. And the women make the comments, the men make the comments, and it seems like I hear a lot of older women say, things are great now. You didn't practice law, but I practice law. You have iPhones now. Things are great for you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, you, don't, you can go home and be with your family, but I'm totally checked out. Um, do you all see that, or do you think this is something that the young millennial generation were just a bunch of whiners? <laughs> Those aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> As I said earlier, I have moments where I you know, turn that reflection inside and go, did that just happen because, right, fill in the blank. I, as a young associate, I would think, did that happen because I'm young and I don't have gray hair? I have lots of gray hair, it's just really, you know, well covered with chemicals. <laughs> so the older I get, the less I can blame it on you, right? And, and so, again, these are, these are moments of introspection where I say, why did that just happen? And where I can't come up with an explanation, you know, maybe my default is there's still a woman thing going on, or there's still a, you know, a, my voice can't be heard kind of thing. And, and that may be true. Um, I think what everybody tries to say is even if that is true, you know, it, you nevertheless have to persevere through. You nevertheless have to find your moments, you know, where you make an issue of it or where you just sort of sit on it. Um, and, and we talked about mentors and we talked about finding people who can support you and, and who can get you through those moments where you feel more discouraged than encouraged. And that's when you need to call on the people around you that help you through that moment. Um, I, I encourage you to have mentors also who challenge and annoy you. That's pretty easy for me because a lot of people challenge it. <laughs> you know, but, but, but again, look for explanations. Open your mind to the possibility that, you know, that, that thing that isn't clear to you, that black box, the thing that is less than transparent, where you're going to fill in the explanation, it's because I'm a woman. I want you to take that, and it may be true, but I want you to put it aside and say, what else could it be? Because that's how you make yourself better. And it's not because I'm denying that it's true and that it's happening. I'm just saying as a person... The one thing that I can do as a human being to persevere is either to take that viewpoint. We talked in our preparation for the panel about there's a difference between sort of what a human being does to bridge gender barriers, you know, which I think what a lot of what you're hearing is you, you forge on, you forge on, you forge on, you persevere. But what do institutions do about it is a different question, because I think institutions, law schools and law firms and the judiciary and the bar associations and whoever else cares to study this has to get the information that says, is it happening, is it real, and if so, what is it, and for what reasons, and how do we attack them? That is hard, hard stuff. The, the, the lean in book, the Cheryl, want to attack them. The, the Cheryl, yeah, to, is there a reason to, the Cheryl Sandberg book, when I enjoyed it the most, was when she would make reference to sociological studies that would say, you know, 
it, in a lecture dynamic, when the professor was calling on students, he you know tended to call on all men and not women. That was a study that was done. That was information. That wasn't what did I perceive. That was an anecdotal. That was a systematic study, and I think that has to be done and has to be recognized. You have to articulate the case for why diversity matters. It has to matter to the businesses, because and it has to matter to the society. And, to the, and I think we as women, what can we do other than persevere? Redefine the issues to be issues that are more uh, generational issues, issues that apply to everybody so that you can pull everybody in. We're sitting in here in a room full of women. We need to co-opt the men and make them their issues too so that everybody is helping to solve them. Let's make them family issues, right? How many men of your generation don't you know, want to think about being parents too, coaching soccer teams too? This isn't just, some of the issues aren't just women's issues. And we have to decipher which ones are really gender issues and which ones are an issue we can co-opt and make everybody a part of. So am I experiencing it in my head sometimes and is it real? Yes, but nevertheless, let's, let's do that institutionally and, as, and then as human beings, the part we do is set it aside and persevere. Can I have a problem? Okay. One last short comment. One, a couple comments I wanted to make is um, uh, these issues can be man's issues too, and so that's one thing to keep in mind, especially with this generation, is that we need to be just as supportive of the man who wants to take care of the child, the man who's going to take uh, a, a career. Um, setback um, for the family, and that's really hard because we're not currently, men are not supporting other men who do that. But I want to just mention some comment, and that is that when, uh, it occurred to me, uh, I thought of that, um, this, you know, Abraham Lincoln said that if you, know, if you look for the bad in someone, surely you will find it. <laughs> if you look for the offensive motive in a comment, you're bound to find it. So my suggestion would be, be proud of who you are and what you are and what your choices are. Because if you're good at what you do, and you've chosen to have a child, and when you come back and if you think that there's been some discrimination, if you're good at what you do, you've got some support that you can probably challenge the firm because you, you can show how your work doesn't serve it. But if you don't want to do that, you've got the model right here. You can go out on your own. I mean, you've got so many opportunities. So there's really no... I, it's not beneficial, I think, for just for us to look for the offensive motive. You can find it, but you don't have to. And I think that's a good note on which to end this part. As you can see, I, mean, I have pages of questions that we could have gotten to and that we might have discussed, but we don't have time, so let me invite Jennifer Elaine back to the podium to wind us up, and we can continue conversing. Yeah, Hi all, my name is Angela Harris. This is Jennifer Dominion, and we're the co-vice presidents of education for Will So. And we just wanted to finish up the symposium today, first of all, by starting off with the biggest thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> amazing and varied and wisdom and experiences with us. We're very special to be able to have you all here today. Um, we also want to thank the administration of WNL. Apparently there has been a history of fostering and supporting women at this law school, and that's great that continues here, um, especially Professor Belmont and, of course, Professor Wine for moderating the panel today. Thank you so much for all of your help. Um, and, of course, the Wilson Board, Maddie, we would not have been able to do this without you at all, so thank you so much for your help. And Rachel was not here right now because she's always running around doing things. So <laughs> Rachel put together this whole reception for us. Um, and for all of you, for the students for attending and the guests for attending and realizing how important it was to have this event today. So thank you. I sincerely hope that today's symposium will spark conversations, inspire debates, and allow us to challenge the gender gap and break down future barriers. Listening to our speakers today has given us a wealth of invaluable advice. And I hope you will all carry on those conversations during our networking reception in the midcourt lobby in just a few minutes. But before we let you all go, we have a few shameless plugs. Shameless will so plugs. Okay, so two will so events coming up. Um, next Thursday, April 2nd, from 5 to 7 on the Law School patio is the Pairing for Hope event. 
which is the wine tasting and this island option. And all the proceeds from that go to Project Horizon and the Wilson Scholarship for students for this summer. Um, so that's going to be a really great event. And then on Friday, April 3rd, we're introducing a new event, Mr. W&L, which is a light-hearted Miss America-themed male beauty pageant. <laughs> the real crown of winner from one of our current law students. And proceeds from that event also go to the Wilson Scholarship. And it's going to be right here in the courtroom at 8. And there's a cocktail reception at 6.30 beforehand. So hope to see you all at both of the events. <laughs> and now you've been sitting for close to three hours, and we'd like to, for you to join us now in the